19th of October 2024. What did he tell the country was the source of these 200 cows? If I remember correctly, in the televised address of, by the Deputy President on that fateful night, he did say that uh, the Kalenjin people of the Rift Valley have gifted him the cows that he keeps in his farm. Can you now read for us Article 76, one of the Constitution, what he says about gifts given to public officers? Article 76, financial property of state officers. 76, one. A gift or donation to a state officer or a public or official, or on a public or official occasion is a gift or donation to the Republic and shall be delivered to the state unless exempted under an act of parliament. Has the deputy president presented any evidence that he surrendered these gifts to the state? He, he says that he has kept them in his farm. Wouldn't that be an admission by his own public statement of violating chapter six? Indeed, it is an admission and should be treated as such. Let's go to the land in Meru. Have you placed any evidence to prove this allegation? I have placed evidence to prove that the Deputy President indeed acquired land in Meru. And to the best of my recollection, he has also admitted in his response to having bought land in Meru. I now want you to quote volume eight against, again, the Deputy President's response. Let's go to, first of all, volume six, which is the deputy president's response. What does he say about the Olive Garden Hotel? In summary, it's clause 1.1.1 .1 yes. all the way. For clarity, counsel, so yes. we leave the issue of Meru, we come to, we come to. We'll come to it later, don't worry. Let's, let's deal with Olive Garden what? Hotel for now. Volume six of, which is the deputy, President's response. We made an allegation that the Deputy President has bought Olive Garden Hotel through proxies. Volume 6, page? Volume 6, page 2 or 534. 2? Yes, page, page two, 2 or 534. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Senators, in my motion I made allegations that the Deputy President has bought the Olive Garden Hotel, initially owned by his late brother. And in response, the Deputy President said as follows. The allegation that I own Olive Garden Hotel is false. Yes. The truth is that Olive Garden Hotel used to belong to my deceased brother, the late Honorable James Nderito Gashagwa, and therefore has never been my property. This is information that most of you may be aware of as it is in the public domain. Upon his demise, my late brother left a will in which, in his recognition, that I am an honest man. We can leave it there, an honest man is written in bold, right? He appointed me as one of the executors of his estate. Now, is the DP's response about God, Olive Garden, which runs from page two to three, consistent with the affidavit in the National Assembly's volume eight by Peterson Jomo Mushira? Maybe so that we can point members. On volume eight, we have the affidavit of Mr. Peterson Njomo Mushira. And Tell us in summary, because we are so Mr. pressed for time. Peterson Njomo Mushira says, I have personal knowledge of one of the issues raised in the special motion for the removal from office by impeachment of Mr. Rigadi Gashagwa, the deputy president. I have personal knowledge of the facts relating to the sale of Olive Garden Hotel which initially formed part of the estate of the late Nerito Gashagwa. Given the matters set out in the preceding paragraph, I am competent to swear this affidavit. I decided to swear this affidavit after my attention was drawn to contradictions between the contents 
of part 1.1 on pages 1 to 2 of the response that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa filed at the National Assembly on 8th October in opposition to the special motion for his removal. B, remarks made by Honorable Okomas Mwengi Mutusa when prosecuting the motion at the National Assembly and remarks made by Honorable Kimani Shumwa at the National Assembly. Remarks made by members of the Assembly. Let's go to the next paragraph in the interest of time. He wished, I wish to clarify and state as follows. I am a shareholder and director of TM Civil Engineering Limited, the company referred to in the agreement annexed on pages 10 to 34 of the Deputy President's response to the motion. On, ar on around 31st of March 2023, the Deputy President approached and convinced me to purchase the Olive Garden Hotel, which was at the time part of the estate of the late Nirito Gashagwa. Let's go to D. In D. To C. He avers that in now, summary, let's go to C. No, C. The Deputy President persuaded me to enter into an informal secret arrangement, the secret arrangement, regarding the transaction embodied in the agreement annexed on page 10 to 34 of his response to the motion. In summary, the terms of the secret agreement were that, one, the Deputy President would buy the hotel for me by refunding the purchase price of 412 million set out in the agreement annexed on page 10 to 34 of his response. Two, the Deputy President would, inst would instruct and pay a contractor to renovate the hotel after the completion of the transaction embodied in the agreement. Three, to protect the Deputy President's undisclosed interest in the hotel, I would appoint Ms. Julianne Jahenda as a signatory or agent for the hotel's account at the Cooperative Bank of Kenya. And four, to further protect the Deputy President's undisclosed interest, Mrs. Julianne Jahenda will run the hotel. That Ms. Julian Jaheda, is it the same person mentioned in volume 8A on page 1 of 19? Volume 8A. Yes, this is a, this is a letter from the Public Service Commission. So does that mean we have two sources, one being Jomo Mushira? It is... We are on uh, volume 8A, page 1 of 19. And there is an and, entry and there, the third name in that you look at The names, you have the first one, the second one, and the third one is Maka Giuliani Jahenda. Is that the who is, same... Who is, that, who is our deputy director in charge of coordination? in the presidency at the office of the deputy president working on a local contract. Who is the author of this document? The author of this document is the Public Service Commission of Kenya. Does this document, is it consistent with what Johnson Moshira said in his affidavit it about shows, Julian Jahenda? It shows that Julian Jahenda is a staff and a close associate of the deputy president and she's the She's the same person who was seconded to manage his interest at the Olive Garden Hotel. The acquisition of this hotel through a secret arrangement from the estate of his brother, is it consistent with a honest man as written in bold font in his response? It is indeed consistent with our allegation that His Excellency, the Deputy President, raided the estate of his late brother and acquired properties directly and through proxy. Lastly, from me, so that Mr. Wanyama will wrap up, let's go to the Vipingo property that also be belonged to the estate of his brother. And for senators to note, this is another 535 million, no, 412 million in terms of the purchase and renovations, another extra millions of money, and there is no disclosure as to where the money was coming from. Now let's go to the Pingo Beach Resort, which again the Deputy President wants to hide under the shadow of his late brother, who is given on page 18 of volume 2A as the directors of the Pingo Beach Resort Limited. Volume 2A, page 18 of 123. Volume 2A, on page 18, 
we have annexed from CR12, dated 27th September 2024, for Vipingo Beach Resort Limited. And the directors are Keith Ikino Rigathi and Kevin Gashagwa Rigathi and the estate of deceased James Nderito Gashagwa. So let's, let's begin with Kevin, who is the son of the deputy president. Was he an executor of the will that the deputy president has annexed to his, repo, his response? No, the will was to be executed by the deputy president, Mr. Honorable Rigathi Gashagwa, Mr. Advocate Njoroge Rogeru, and Mr. Minor. So the children of the deputy president were not executors of the estate and therefore cannot be said to be in the directorship of this company by virtue of the will of the late Rigathi Gashagwa because they were not named as executors of his estate. So is this document on its face consistent with his defense that this hotel belongs to his late brother? It flies on the face. But let's see whether he actually acquired it. Let's go to volume four, page 107 of 484. I am at uh, volume four, page 107. What is that document, sir? This is a joint will executor's report on the status of the estate as at 27th February 2024. This is the estate of the late Nderito Gashagwa. And what does it tell us about Kuruitu Home Resort in Roman 3 on that page. The broad headline is sale of estate's assets. And it lists number one, Queensgate, Olive Garden Hotel, and then Kuruitu Home Resort. Yes. And it says as follows. The resort was sold to Kuruitu Properties Limited for Kenya shillings 250. Uh, what page of that volume? That's this volume is a, four. Volume this four, is a, Mr. Speaker, page 107 of 484. Volume four, Mr. Speaker. We, page. Can, we can continue? Yes, proceed. Kuruwitu Home Resort. The resort was sold to Kuruwitu Properties Limited for Kenya shillings 250 million only. Let's stop, let's stop there. Yes. Is Kuruwitu Properties Limited to which this hotel or resort was sold a company linked to the deputy president? Indeed, and we have appended, we have annexed in our volume 2A. Yes. If honorable speaker and, and senators would go to our volume 2A of our exhibits at page eight. We have volume 2A, page eight. We have uh, annexed the form CR12 in respect of Kuruwitu. And, and who are shown as the directors there? The directors are Vipingo Beach Resort Limited. But Vipingo let's Beach, also interrogate. Vipingo, Vipingo Beach Resort Limited, which we have demonstrated that is owned by Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa's children. Back to volume four, page 111 of 484. Can you read at the top the sentence that begins with, for instance? This is, uh, we are at page 111. And this of 484, is, Mr. This, Speaker, still, volume four. This is still, uh, this is, this is uh, for, so that we, this is still the joint will executor's report. And at, uh, at the top there, the, at page 111, for instance, the sale of Kuruitu Beach Resort Cottages and Olive Gardens Hotel was done after beneficiaries were appraised in the meeting of 24th June 2023, cited herein before. Significantly, the beneficiaries themselves in their meetings with one of the executors, underline one of the executors, approved the sale of Kuruitu Home Resort to one of them, underline one of them. Where is who, who, who is also an executor, underline who is also an executor. Who, who is the executor and beneficiary being referred to here? The only executor and beneficiary of the late Nerito Gashagwa's estate, as named in the will, and as named in this joint report, is one Honorable Rigathi Gashagwa.
Where is this property located, Honorable Mutuse? The Pingo Beach? Yes. Should be somewhere in the coast. Back to page 107 of volume 4. In his response, as, as the deputy president explained where he got the sum of Kenya shillings, 250 million, to purchase this property. In fact, he denies buying the property. Mr. Speaker, I will cede the floor now to my London friend, Mr. Wanyama, to prosecute the remaining grounds of the motion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I'll proceed from where uh, my colleague Mdomi has uh, left. Honorable Mutuse, uh, can you go to ground number two of your motion? We'll be there shortly. I think that's page 10 of uh, volume one. Here we are. Yes, what is the nature of this ground? What are you complaining about? We are complaining that the Deputy President has on numerous occasions violated Article 147.1 as read together with one, Article 152.1 of the Constitution of Kenya. And in particular, Article 147.1 provides that the Deputy President shall be the principal assistant of the President and shall deputize for the presidents in the execution of the president's functions. While Article 152.1 of the Constitution states that the deputy president is a member of the cabinet. And in particular, we, I became, I, through cabinet communique, as you are aware, after every time there is a cabinet meeting, there is normally a press release that is released. And we were aware of a decision of the cabinet of the 30th April 2024, where the cabinet passed a resolution to evacuate members of the public for their own safety from the 30 meter riparian zone of the Nairobi River. Yes. And when that decision was made, in so far as I understand processing of business in the cabinet, the deputy president sat in cabinet. The deputy president is one who chairs cabinet subcommittees, which process business before going to cabinet. And therefore, to my own understanding, he was fully involved in the making of that decision. However, okay, again, just to cut you short because yes. of time, the allegation is that uh, the deputy president uh, has been undermining uh, uh, the president. Yes. Do you have evidence in your motion that support this allegation? Yes, I have evidence. Which evidence is this? This the evidence is in respect of the cabinet resolution regarding the evacuation of the riparian, of the settlers around the riparian area, in that area, and our evidence is contained in the affidavit of Ms. Masi Wanjau. Where is this affidavit of Masi Wanjau? The affidavit of Masi Wanjau is to be found on page 78 to 80 of volume one. Has the DP admitted these allegations? Yes, the DP has admitted the allegation to say there was a cabinet resolution, but he went against it. Where is the admission contained for purpose of the Hansen? The admission by the deputy president? If you look at uh, paragraphs 10.1.1 and 10.1.3 of the DP's response. Yeah. Yeah. Volume on page. Volume 6. Uh -huh. Page 19 of 534, paragraph 1011, he says as follows. The office of the deputy president has undertaken extensive engagement with all parties in regard to the cabinet decision on eviction, which I fully support, including the Nairobi River, which is an entity under the ODP. Okay, okay, I think we can hold, we, we, we can stop there. So yes. in your opinion, as a move of the motion, can, can the government of Kenya function if the deputy president and the president are not reading from the same page? It will be very difficult 
for the government to function and to deliver effectively to the people of Kenya when the two highest office holders are reading from different scripts and especially when the deputy president for political expedience would disown decisions of the cabinet in a meeting that he sat through to make a decision. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, uh, you have, uh, have you annexed any videos to prove uh, this allegation? Yes, indeed. Video number? We have annexed uh, video number 10. Video number 10. Video number 10. And, and also video number 10. What does video number 10, uh, what is it all about? Maybe they can play it for honorable senators to see for themselves. Can you play video number 10 briefly? Mr. Speaker. Watu ya kayole. Tangu mutupatia nafasi ya uongozi. Sija pata nafasi ya kuja kusema asanti. Nataka kutoka kwa roo yangu. Watu ya kayole asanteni sana. Mimi najua nimeona iko shida ya watu ambaye walibomolewa. Si ndio? Maybe you can Na nimeona uh, mmeandika vizuri. Speaker, sir, because of time you are ya requesting you play at uh, kamati ya watu wachache. What at uh, 1 minute 25. Na nyinyi. 1.25. Utakubaliana? Because of time. Mimi ningetaka wale watu ambaye walipata shida hii ya upomoaji ambaye ni kitu tulikuwa tumeahidi wananchi haitafanyika kwa serikali yetu mimi ningetaka niwasikize na nitapanga na mheshimiwa Meja Dong wakuje ndio tukue na nafasi ya kuongea let us not have a war with wananchi tusipigane na wananchi wale walituchagua let us be empathetic let us if people must move let there be an engagement and let people get adequate notice so that they can prepare for their next life ahead. You can't wake up one morning and terminate people's life. Let us not have a... Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, so we can uh, stop there because of time. The video has been submitted as part of the evidence from the National Assembly. Uh, uh, on the let's go to ground number, uh, allegation number three, ground number three very quickly. What is it all about? What is your complaint in the Senate, in ground number three? Our complaint to the Senate is that the Deputy President has undermined devolution. Why do you say so, briefly? We say so because there was a lawful decision by the city county of Nairobi about- Which is this lawful decision? You can be specific. The city county of Nairobi did make a, a resolution Yes. To relocate traders from CBD to Kangundo Road. Uh -huh. And the Deputy President, through evidence that we, are, we, are, we have... Is that, de is that decision to relocate uh, uh, traders a county government function? Yes. And Senate, because it is a house that is created under Article 96 to protect the interests of counties, would take notice that... Uh, Markets under Schedule 4 is an exclusive function of counties. Yes. Have you submitted any video evidence to support this allegation that the Deputy President has undermined the devolved government system, especially the current government of Nairobi? Yes, video 12 and video 13, where members of the Senate shortly will see that the Deputy President went to Wakulima Market and incited members of the public not to obey lawful directives of the county, city county of Nairobi. We have also, as part of our evidence, annexed the sworn affidavit of Mr. Johnson Sakaja, the governor of Nairobi, with averments to that effect. This is at page 81 to 85 of our volume one. Okay, I think the, 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 the video is part of the, 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 the evidence. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's part of the record. Uh, so why do you complain uh, about this in the Senate? Why are you Just complaining? The senators want to see the video, want to hear, okay. Okay. see and hear the video. Can we play video 12? 
Ruby Governor Johnson Sakaja appear headed for yet another round of an influence contest of the capital city, with the Deputy President putting the Governor on notice over the alleged mistreatment of traders in the city. And as Citizen TV's Milita Olatengas reports, the latest rupture in the relations between the two have been compounded by the broader tribulations of Gashagwa, who sees himself as being sidelined by the Kenya Kwanzaa State House. Two years ago, downtown Nairobi, in the thick of the campaign train, and fast forward to this on Friday. In the same style and fashion, he returned to Marikiti, heightening the standoff with Sakaja over traders' relocation. Gashagwa says he made a promise that he holds dear, but the governor seems to be having a different vision for the county. Nobody should imagine that they can micromanage the county of Nairobi from anywhere. No one should imagine that we will suspend devolution in Nairobi from anywhere. A stop. Uh, so, Honorable uh, Mutuse, is that uh, act by the deputy president impeachable? It is impeachable in the sense that uh, the two levels of government have been assigned their roles and their functions under Schedule 4 of the Constitution. Yes. And the Constitution and Article 6 requires that the two levels of government, much as they are independent, they also respect their functional independence. And that uh, if the county government makes a decision, it is upon them to implement that decision. You would realize, much as Nairobi is the capital city of Kenya, cosmopolitan, when the deputy president went there, he addressed Kenyans in his native language. Is it compatible with the status of deputy president to address uh, these core issues at a marketplace like this? It is not consistent. The expectation was that through the intergovernmental relations framework that is already established in law, there would have been a formula to deal with that issue outside the rally. Which is this framework president. that you are talking about? The framework that you are talking about for intergovernmental relations, to be specific. Eh? Well, there is the, we have the Intergovernmental Relations Act. Uh -huh. And it will be expected that the Deputy President, being the chair of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee and also IBEC, would have exercised his responsibility under the law and those responsibilities yes. to call a meeting with the city county of Nairobi to deliberate on those issues if indeed there were complaints from the citizens of Nairobi in a manner that is consistent with the running, formal running of a government. Okay. Uh, I think because of time we can move to allegation number four. Are you there? Just go to your motion, allegation number four. What is it all about? Explain briefly to the honorable senators. Allegation number four, I believe it's one, on page 14 one, of your motion. One minute, one minute, one minute. Yes, here we are. Now, our ground for, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Senators, is gross violation of Article 161 of the Constitution, specifically undermining the institutional and decisional independence of judges. Hold on, hold on, Honorable Mutus. What do you understand by the word gross? You're using it in a context, and I think it is important you explain briefly. What do you understand by the meaning of the word gross? My understanding of gross violation of the Constitution. I don't know whether I'll be speaking in my knowledge as a lawyer or just as a... Just give your opinion. What is gross? It goes into the answer there. The gross violation of the Constitution, the best would be found in the Wambora decision. Okay. The Wambora decision did define what gross violation of the Constitution means. Yes. And it is said it is the violation of Article 10, Article 1, and several articles of the Constitution. I do not have the particular citation, but to my mind, I think it's paragraph 46 of that decision. 
Okay. Uh, so let's go back to allegation number four, uh, ground number four. What is it that you're complaining about in this ground? In we summary? Are, we are complaining that uh, the deputy president did threaten in a manner that displayed person of vendetta, the person of Esther Maina, a judge of the High Court of Kenya, and the reason for threatening her with filing a motion, a petition for a removal from office mm -hmm. was particularly in relation to a decision that she made in a case that was involving the deputy president by finding that assets to the tune of cash 202 million that were held in his company's accounts were proceeds of corruption and money laundering. And for making that decision, the deputy president, against the provisions of Article 161, threatened that Justice Maina is with corruption and with removal from office. Yeah, this decision that you're talking about, uh, Justice Maina's decision, where is it? You can uh, point it out to the Honorable Senators. This decision, the judgment of Esther Maina. Honorable Senators, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Senators, in our volume 2A at page 60 to, at page 60 all the way to page, all the way to page 77, uh -huh. we have annexed the judgment of the Honorable Judge Esther Maina, where many of the companies that we have stated in the other allegations are listed here as companies that are conduits of corruption and money laundering. Which companies are these in the judgment? Just maybe you can name uh, a few of them so that we are more specific for the answer. Uh, you have heard us talk about Crystal Kenya. Crystal Kenya is here. You're this saying Crystal, what... uh, Crystal Kenya is mentioned in the judgment? Yes, this okay. is on page 64. Uh -huh. And many, many others. So that with Wamonyoro Investments, you have others mentioned Wamonyoro Investment. Wamonyoro is mentioned here several times. So what is the conclusion by the judge in that judgment, eh? the, the decision that you are complaining about? The judge said that in the upshot, the original motion is granted in terms of prayers two. This is page 77 of 123 in our volume 2 here. That a declaration is hereby issued that the following funds are proceeds of crime and therefore liable for forfeiture to the state. And they are listed there, 165 million held in a certain account at Rafiki Finance Bank, 35 million in the name of Rigathi Gashagwa, 773,000. How much in total did the judge find to be uh, money that uh, the Ritu Gashagwa at the time had uh, that, obtained through proceeds of corruption? That order is hereby issued that the above funds be forfeited to the government of Kenya and transferred to the Assets Recovery Agency and the amount is about 200 million shillings. So he finds Mr. Mr. Rigadi Gashagwa to have obtained uh, 200 million shillings, is that to correct? To have been unable to explain 200 million how he obtained 200 million shillings. What did, what did the judge do after that finding? The judge directed that the, the amounts be forfeited to forfeited. the government of Kenya through the Asset Recovery Agency, which is the body created under the Proceeds of Crime and Money Laundering Act to take care of uh, money laundering. Yeah, Mr. Ongoya, for the deputy president who was here, and the family stated that, the, that you have no ground at all to bring this allegation in the Senate. What is your specific complaint in the Senate on this allegation? My specific complaint is that uh, when a judge in a functional democracy and in a country of rule of law like ours, when a judge makes a finding against, and the judges make findings against all of us every day, mm. the civil way of challenging that decision is through an appeal. So you appeal the decision. You do not go to a rally and start threatening judges because then you create fear and you create fear in the judges so that they are not able to exercise their decision or independence. You can interfere with financing of the judiciary. You can interfere with many, many other things, but let's not track away the decision of independence. Honorable Mutuse, uh, do you have any evidence that you've submitted to the Senate to prove this allegation of, you're calling it interference with the independence of the judiciary? Do you have any video evidence, any evidence? Yes, 
I have presented video number 14 and video number 15. I being, request the video, being, Mr. Speaker, to be of the, the bulletin with the war on the judiciary, where Kenya Kwanzaa administration is making good on its threat, with the Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa now filing a petition to push for the removal of a judge from office. Gashagwa says he will on Thursday file a petition with the Judicial Service Commission to push for the removal of Justice Esther Minor, who handled an economic crimes case against him in 2022 for alleged corruption and and misconduct. Now speaking in Iten, where he accompanied President William Ruto for a church service, Gashagwa told the Chief Justice to first clean up her house by dealing with pending cases with the Judicial Service Commission. Now in the sustained onslaught against the judiciary, President William Ruto vowed to deal with unnamed government officers he described as incompetent, saying his administration will slay the corruption monster that has reared its ugly head in various arms of government. Chamatai Goin reports. After Chief Justice Martha Kome invited Kenyans with complaints over the conduct of judicial officers to submit their lamentations to her office, the Kenya Kwanzaa administration, through Deputy President Rigathi Gashagwa, has taken the challenge, with the DP announcing that he will file a petition this week. And the challenge is easy to throw a Shahidi. I will lead by example. On Thursday, this coming week, at 2.15, I will personally present a petition before Lady Chief Justice Martha Kome against Justice Esther Minor for her removal from the judiciary for misconduct and corruption. Because, eh, Sasa Unajua Sasa, Si Ametuliza. Gashagwa relieving his July 2022 incident where 202 million shillings was seized to the state after Justice Esther Minor ruled the money was proceeds of corruption having been acquired through dubious means. Who your judge through corruption declared my hard and worth wealth proceeds of crime without giving me an opportunity to be hard. Again, is the rules of evidence where he who alleges must prove. We made an application to cross-examine the investigator Akata. Wasababu anajua, there is no case. Na evidence to konayo vile rifanyika. The Kenya Kwanzaa Battalion hitting out at Koome for being quick to defend judicial officers, some of whom they claim were not beyond reproach. I think we can stop the yeah. police. We can stop there. Uh, now, Honorable Mutuse, it looks like in this public forum, uh, statements were generally made uh, against the judiciary. Is that correct? By all politicians who attended. Yes, it, uh, it, is, it is correct that even others who are there made statements against the judiciary. And, so what, and, and there is no problem with that. Yeah, yeah. So what is so extraordinary? Mr. Ongoya said, there's nothing extraordinary about your complaint. My complaint is extraordinary in the sense that the Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa was not complaining about the judiciary. He was complaining about a specific judge for a decision that she made, a finding that she made against him. It was not about corruption in the judiciary. It was not about inefficiency in the judiciary. It was not about how the judiciary runs. It was about who you judge. Ali Alisema mali yangu ni mali ya wizi. Now, in that, in that, in that uh, uh, public statement, the deputy president uh, says he has evidence on corruption against Lady Justice Minor. In his response filed before this house, have you seen any evidence adduced for corruption against Lady Justice uh, Esther Minor? I have not seen any evidence to show that indeed he has evidence of corruption influencing the judge to make the finding that the 200 million were proceeds of crime. Okay. Uh, now, this judgment... Which, which, uh, that which you... leads me yes, to yes. my in conclusion that this is personal vendetta. What do you mean by personal vendetta? 
person of Ntetra is, you are here in Senate representing your people, you make decisions in Senate, you make debate in Senate as part of your constitutional mandate, you mention people who are not doing things right, and when you get out there, they threaten you. They tell you, when you say that again in Senate, I'll kill you. Okay. I'll get you removed from Senate to create fear. Person of vendetta. Now, this judgment which you've said is available at uh, page 60 to 77, and you quoted it of volume 2A of your documents. Eh? Uh, could, 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 uh, could you by any chance know what happened to this judgment? Yes, I am aware that uh, indeed the Deputy President did appeal against that decision. Yes. But on becoming Deputy President, the same was settled through a consent, a compromise, as, as it would be, uh, and the money was returned to him. The money was returned to him. Have, have, you, have you seen this consent that was recorded at the Court of Appeal? Yes, I am aware of the consent. Okay, you are aware? I am aware that uh, the consent was not arrived based on the merits or the merits of the case. Okay. It was just uh, government bodies, because leadership has changed hands, and uh, the second in command now is powerful, a few government bodies, as a recovery agency, they went to court and say, they said they want to withdraw final the case. Finally, Honorable Mutu says, is there a decision of the Court of Appeal? A decision of the Court of Appeal upsetting or setting aside this judgment and the finding by uh, Lady Justice Esther Maina about To, to my excellency. understanding and the lawyers in the House will also have the same finding. There is no decision of the Court of Appeal. Have you seen any of this response? Over, overturning Justice Minor's decision, and therefore Justice Minor's decision remains good law. You have come through the response by His Excellency regarding Kashago. Have you seen any appeal decision setting aside? No, there is any the, order setting aside the judgment? The, the consent is there, but there is no, uh, there is no decision on merit okay. on the Court of Appeal. Okay. And the let's go to ground number eight, eh? allegation number eight. Eh? And briefly explain to the... Maybe, maybe before we leave there... Yes, yes, yes. It is important in terms of... Because we are complaining about Article 160... Yeah, yeah. For me to just read 165. A yeah, member of the judiciary is not liable in an action or suit in respect of anything done or omitted to be done in good faith in the lawful performance of a judicial function. Okay. Because that is a particular session, we are complaining that the deputy president has violated. Has violated. Okay. Um, so, in your in your opinion, does undermining the independence of the judiciary amount to gross violation of the constitution? Indeed, it amounts to gross violation of the constitution. It will be, remember that we have three arms of government: the executive, the legislature where we, we sit, and the judiciary. Is it proper for the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya to make this kind of attacks? Is it proper in your opinion? It, it is not proper at all. Okay. And what, in your, uh, again, to, to, to just wrap that, uh, that point up, huh? what channels... Counsel, before exist? you get there, you refer to a consent. Is it contained in any of these bundles? The Senators would wish to look at that consent. Rebbe Mutuse, you said uh, you have seen a consent. You are aware about it. Have you seen the consent? It is uh, not filed in our documents, yeah. but uh, in my ordinary course of business, I am aware of the consent. Okay. If it becomes necessary, I, the Senate has the powers to recall it. In fact, it is a public document because it is reported under Kenya law reports. Fair enough. Um, Let's go to allegation number eight because of time, so that we don't take a lot of time and uh, finish our time. What's, what is the substance of your allegation number eight? Briefly, ground number eight. Ground number eight is that there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa has committed crimes under section 132 of the Penal Code and section 129 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. And basically here, it is on two folds. The two sections that we have cited, section 132 of the Penal Code and section 29 of the Leadership and Integrity Act speak to state officers misleading the public, spreading falsehoods. And 
On the issue of uh, Justice Minor, as we have shown evidence, it was personal vendetta because the deputy president was attacking the judge based on a decision the judge had made. On the second one, in terms of the particulars, His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa recklessly yes. and unmindfully and mindful of the high calling and dignified status of the office of the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, as well as his membership to the National Security Council and Article, 140, and Article 240 of the Constitution, both being positions that require one to be discreet and tempered, especially during moments of national crisis, addressed Kenyans on live television in Mombasa County and publicly made sensational statements against the National Intelligence Service an essential national security organ is Director General and the officers. And the officers so you, you, you can hold on there. Do you have evidence to prove these allegations about uh, a live television uh, statement in Mombasa by the Deputy President? Do you have any evidence before this House? Yes. We have, uh, we have our next uh, video number 15. May which... I request we play video number 15, please, Mr. Speaker? Where did the rain begin to beat us? Where did we stop listening to the people? President William Ruto and I were the darling of the Kenyan people. By listening to them, by engaging them. And as a government, we have established institutions to ensure we not only listen to Kenyans, but also genuinely understand their concerns. We invest significant resources in these institutions, particularly the National Intelligence Service for this purpose. It is clear there has been a failure in the intelligence and advice we are receiving, particularly concerning crucial government policies. The President of the Republic of Kenya today has admitted that it has come to his attention that the people of Kenya did not want anything to do with the Finance Bill 2024. Uh, Honorable President, uh, maybe we can... Uh... No, there is an yeah, okay, okay. okay. You, you, you has now you agreed pay? that we need to listen to the people. Yeah. And I sympathize with my boss, President William Ruto, because this information was not available to him. I know President William Ruto. Had he known two months ago that the people of Kenya did not want anything to do with the Finance Bill 2024, he would not have asked his parliamentary party to push it through. Yet, we have an organization paid by the public to give him and government such information. And that is where the problem is. We have a dysfunctional national intelligence service that has exposed the president, the government, and the people of Kenya. Had the national intelligence service briefed the president two months ago about how the people of Kenya feel about the finance bill 2024, so many Kenyans would not have died. Property would not have been destroyed. Offices would not have been touched. There would have been no mayhem. But they slept on the job. It had to take people to die, property to be destroyed, protests across the country for the president to know the truth of what the people of Kenya feel. Yet, there is an organization paid for by the public to brief the president and the government about the feeling of the Kenyan people. Officers of the National Intelligence Service, have, or officers of the National Police Service, have told me in confidence they did not get advance intelligence briefs about the magnitude of the protest in Eldoret, in Kericho, in Nairobi, in Gedurai, in Embu, in Nyeri. Since independence, there has been protests in, around Parliament. Never have protesters invaded and gotten inside parliament. 
senior officers have told me in confidence they did not have an advanced intelligence brief about the intensity of the protest that they prepare in advance. The National Intelligence Service slept on the job. And the problem is simple. The Director General of the National Intelligence Service, Nuddin Haji, was a junior officer in the National Intelligence Service before he was appointed as DVP. When he was appointed to the office of the Director General, because of inferiority complex, he chased away all the people who were senior to him when he was in the service. They are for crippling the capacity of that service and making it dysfunctional. Three directors were chased away and reassigned to desk jobs in Mr. Speaker, sir, we can uh, post it at that because of time. We've, we've captured the parts. Now, on the Bumtuse, uh, the deputy president recently addressed a press conference where he rubbished this allegation. He said it's pure hogwash, nonsense upon stilts. What is your specific complaint against the deputy president in this allegation? Two specific complaints. One, the deputy president is a member of the National Security Council. And if he has any complaints, against the National Intelligence Service, yes. who also sit in the National Intelligence Council. He can raise those concerns there. So that uh, we promote institutional leadership. You mean the National Security Council? The National Security Council created under Article 240 of the Constitution. Yes. And the Deputy President has forum. And like all other ordinary citizens, senators included, as we can complain out there, because we don't have an official institutional forum. The deputy president has forum where he can raise his concerns. Number two, this was a time of monumental crisis in the Republic of Kenya. And the statements were sensational and they would have made Kenyans to believe that our security organs are not functional and would have easily led to citizens running amok and the Republic getting torn apart and our national fabric getting destroyed completely. But even more importantly, I had uh, learned counsel Ongoya refer you to your oath of office. And I would wish that he also refers his client to the oath of due execution of office that he did swear. In the oath of due execution of office that the deputy president took on ascension of office, it states as follows, that I will not directly or indirectly reveal such matters as shall come to my knowledge in the discharge of my duties and committed to my secrecy, emphasis, secrecy. He has said in the clip that we have played that officers of the National Police Service have told him in confidence that they had not received advanced intelligence reports. That is, the, that is the, what was contemplated by this oath of due execution of office, what senior counsel Orengo called addressing fears that if a matter is committed to you as a state officer in secrecy, it must remain in secrecy. If you take it to a public press conference, then you have gone against your oath of office and that is an impeachable offense. Mm -hmm. This oath of office, this oath of office that you say the deputy president takes, is it anchored in any clause of the constitution? Yes. The oath of office is in the third schedule of our constitution and therefore part of our constitution. Can you read Article uh, 148, 5A of the constitution? If, to begin with, under Article 74 of the constitution, before assuming a state office, yes, yes. acting in a state office, or performing any functions of a state office, a person shall take and subscribe the oath or, or affirmation of office in the manner and form prescribed by the third schedule or under an act of parliament. Okay. And what about Article 148, Paragraph 5A? What does it say? Article 148, Paragraph 5A? Yes, yes. It says the Deputy President elect assumes office by taking and subscribing A, the oath of affirmation of allegiance, and B, the oath or affirmation for the execution of the functions of office as prescribed in the third schedule. 
So it is a constitutional issue. Finally, the deputy president in his press statement the other day, he said, even in other countries, the US, stable democracies, uh, it's not common, it's not uncommon to see uh, heads of uh, uh, intelligence institutions being, uh, being attacked or criticized by public officers. What is your comment about that specific remark? Even in our country, it is not uncommon, but it depends on who is doing it. Mm -hmm. The Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya cannot behave in a manner that disparages the institutions of the state that he was elected to superintend, especially so when he has official institutional forum to raise those concerns. Is, is there a forum where the Deputy President can conveniently raise these issues without undermining uh, public confidence in the security system and public trust in these institutions that are paid by the taxpayer. I, have, I have said earlier, under Article 240, the membership of the National Security Committee is number one, the president, and number two, the deputy president. Okay. And the National Intelligence Service is a member, and therefore that can be conversed behind closed doors in a formal way and a decision made so that uh, we do not break down our institutions, instead we empower them. Which, which article of the institution are you, say, are you referring to? Where the National Security Council is established? Article 240, if, I, if my mind serves me right. Okay. And we can read it if we have time. The other explanation by the Deputy President is that these agencies are accountable to the civilian authority and therefore not immune to criticism. Article 240, comment? establishment of the National Security Council. They established the National Security Council. The council consists of the president, the deputy president. So he's a member by dint of Article 240. Okay, okay. And he because, says they are subject to yeah. civilian authority yeah, yeah. Because, of the, because of Article 1. Okay. Yeah, because of time, let's go to the last allegation. Eh? Last allegation. Uh, that's ground number 11. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Okay. Can you explain to the senators this your specific grievance about this ground? It is uh, the we are saying that the deputy president has committed gross misconduct by bullying state officers. Yeah. What specifically? Specific? Yeah, specific ground on that gross misconduct that you we want are saying that uh, to take into consideration. His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa bullied Kenya Medical Supplies Agency officials into awarding a tender for the supply of mosquito nets to Crystal Limited, his proxy company, that had submitted an irregular bid bond with the sole intention of fraudulently acquiring public property. That yeah. His Excellency. And, and basically in relation to KEMSA, so yeah. that uh, we can paraphrase. KEMSA advertised a tender funded by the Global Fund, which is our, one of our major development partners in terms of delivery of healthcare in Kenya. Yes. The tender was valued at about 3.7 billion. At the time, the procurement process got botched up. And Senate would take notice that at that time, the peers in charge of public health and the CEO at KEMSA were dismissed by His Excellency the President. Yes. And then uh, an acting CEO was appointed. And the acting CEO also saw an affidavit to this regard. And the problem here was that there is a, com a company, an Indian-based company, called, this company? called Shobika. Shobika. And Shobika, because we have been told we are bringing in a company that was not, was not, was not part of the tender. In the evidence of the Deputy President, this company called Shobika is represented locally here in Kenya by a company called Crystal Kenya. And that is by the admission of the Deputy President himself in his own response. And Crystal Kenya is the company that we have demonstrated all the way from Nyeri to Malindi to Kilifi, that is the major special purpose vehicle that the Deputy President has been using to acquire property and to, man to launder money. So this company is as, as an agency agreement with Shobika to represent them locally. And what happens, the evidence that we are placed on record is that when Dr. Andrew Muller is appointed the new CEO of KEMSA, at that time, investigations are going on into the irregular procurement of the 3.7 billion mosquito nets. 
And then uh, one of the issues of interest in that, in that tender is how Shobika submitted their bid bond, because the main complaint was that they could submit their bid bond outside the tendering period. So when investigations are going on, the deputy president, who admitted live on television, called Dr. Andrew Muller, the acting CEO of Kemsa, and told him, I have sent my people, please give them that bid bond. And he said uh, he did it because the people were wondering. And then we have annexed messages, WhatsApp, excerpts, in the affidavit of Dr. Andrew Mulwa that is contained on page 67 to in the volume, if you go to volume one, page 67 to page all the way to Just uh, briefly, so that uh, we are factual. Mm. All the way to page 77, we have uh, annexed the affidavit of, the witness affidavit of Dr. Andrew Muller. Okay. And on it, we have also exhibited so let's, SMS let's, let's, messages. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, Andrew Mutuse. Mutuse. Yes. Uh, I think we've seen the affidavit, you've said it's at page 67, eh? Yes, page 67 of volume one. Yeah, and you've said the deputy president uh, interfered with this, uh, attempted to interfere with this tender process, eh? The, it is the evidence. Where, where is that evidence so that we can conclude our testimony? It is the evidence of, on oath yeah. of Dr. Andrew Mulwa. Is that, that the one uh, at page 70? I, if I read, if yes. I read, and Dr. Mulwa is available for purposes of this, he says, on or around 11th July 2023, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa called me from his mobile phone number, and he has given the number there. On my mobile number, and the number is there, this is on page 68. On my page 68, volume one. Page 68, volume one, paragraph four. On my mobile number, and pressured me to surrender to his proxy, the original bid bond submitted by Shobika Impex Limited for the above tender. He told me that he would send a proxy to collect the original bid bond. He goes ahead to state, Dr. Ikino Rigadi, His Excellency Rigadi Gashakua's son, called and sent a WhatsApp message from mobile number indicated, claiming to be acting for and on behalf of His Excellency Rigadi Gashakua's. Uh, he asked for Mutuse, where is that uh, WhatsApp message exhibited so that we can end up? Go to session? page 70. Page 70. Who, go to page 70. Page 70 of your volume. You will see, you will see WhatsApp messages that are exhibited okay. from the phone of Dr. Ikino Rigadi. Who is Ikino Rigadi? He's a son to Rigadi Gashagwa, and the message says as follows. Hello, Dr. Ikino Rigadi here. Kindly conduct me when possible. There's a document for HE. HE is the short form for His Excellency. We are trying to collect. It was, he was not collecting his own document. He was not collecting so we can stop there. a public document. He was collecting a document for HE. We can stop there, Honorable Mutuse. Now, finally, uh, Honorable Mutuse, have you sworn an affidavit uh, to support these allegations against the Deputy President? Yes, indeed. I saw. Where is this affidavit in your. In, in, in volume one yes. of our bundle of documents at page 41, page 41 of 85, page 41 all the way to page 43 is my affidavit in support of all the grounds of impeachment against the deputy president. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. Because of time, we, we want to request to end our examination in chief for this witness. Thank you very much for your indulgence and accommodating us. Now, uh, how much time uh, is remaining out of the three hours? So, counsel for the National Assembly, you have 45 minutes to conclude your case to do re-examination and call the other witnesses and do re-examination in 45 minutes. That is the time remaining. Now, 
counsel for the deputy president. You have two hours in total for cross-examination of all witnesses that will be presented. So you may choose to use all that with this witness, or you may decide on how to, you're going to apportion it. You may now proceed to cross-examine the witness. Your time starts running from now. Mr. Mr. Speaker, sir, I noticed that uh, this is Ongoya for the Deputy President. We have uh, two hours. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, there is a request from our side which we hope will find favor with you. The witness has been on his feet for quite long, and uh, to save time, there is a suggestion that perhaps we could call our next witness, by which time you'll have taken a breather, then we come to his cross examination. But I leave it to your discretion. Give him a seat, and he'll be cross examined while seated. Much obliged, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Once again, Ongoya here for the Deputy President. Our request is that we, the schedule allocates us two hours for cross-examination in total and three hours for our evidence in chief tomorrow.